Humans are animals, and animals exist under the general umbrella of nature. So human beings are a part of nature. This isn't a controversial opinion, is it? Most people seem to understand human beings are a naturally occurring phenomenon. But you hear the way we employ words like natural and artificial, or man-made. Regardless of what people might say when you press them, the overwhelming notion that drives society is that humans are fundamentally separate from nature. What differentiates us from the rest of the natural world? Subjectivity. The world exists and we experience it, but we also use it. We eat food that comes from nature, and we build with materials that come from nature. Given the degree of destruction our activity has wrought on the world, maybe it would be more accurate to say that we exploit and dominate nature. But here's the thing. Humanity being a part of nature isn't just some hippie cliché. It's a fact. And if humans are a part of nature, is it even possible to build an ethos that views nature as a set of resources to be exploited for personal gain that doesn't view humanity itself in the same way? Murray Bookchin certainly didn't think so. This is We Read Theory. Hello, and welcome to We Read Theory, the podcast where we read theory so you don't have to. I'm Mark, and I'm my- Alex. Fuck. Yep, my wonderful friend Alex <laughs> is right there. No, it was good. <laughs> I like it. We're leaving it like that. Oh, Jesus. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. It's not like we haven't left my mistakes in before. You've never done anything wrong in your life, Alex. I know this, and I love me. Um... Okay, kind of like so, perfectly also, just jump, yeah. just jumping into this. Um, have you seen that thing on Netflix where it's about um, psychedelic drugs and like the history of them and how they came to be and how they work? No, I remember, I remember that, that one friend of ours who really likes psychedelic drugs was recommending it some time ago, but uh, I never dipped my toes in. I can't tell if that's, that's a, a, a sub at me or... It's or not, like I would say it could fit you. so many people in our lives. You. Oh my god. Well, anyway, anyway, um, when you when you said um, the world exists and we experience it, direct, right brought me right back to this part where Deepak Chopra is talking about reality and like how you experience it. He's like the way a fly sees reality, the way the dog sees reality is all different. Is that the same reality? Who knows? It's like how we experience it. Reality is fake. Now it's just like whoa, dude. It's, it's kind of like how, how we used to all crowd into our bathroom and smoke weed and talk about how the flies in the bathroom thought that the bathroom was the entire universe. Yeah, I, I don't remember that, but mostly because um, anytime I smoke anything, I'm, I get pretty tired and fall asleep pretty quickly. I can nap almost anywhere. I know, you're very talented. You also like to nap with your eyes open, which is very adorable. Um, I used to, there used to be, um, an Instagram account dedicated to pictures of me fully unconscious with my eyes half yeah. open. You're going to, you're going to link the deets for the, for the nice people. Uh, I've since deleted it. I've deleted <laughs> it. I've moved past the need That's for like... Finstas as, um, uh, a, a mostly functioning adult. And a, and a budding public figure. Oh my God. Don't flatter me. <laughs> Look at you. <laughs> oh, and if I... you want to connect with this public yeah. figure, you can do so. First, first mid episode plug um, at We this Read is... Theory on Twitter. <laughs> we Read Theory Pod. I, I fucked up. Yeah. Do you wanna Do you wanna uh, read a little theory right now? Oh my god, that'd be so nice. All right. So let's talk a little bit about Murray Bookchin and the ecology of freedom. As we explored in the intro, humans are subjective, but we're also part of nature. When we act, nature, in a sense acts through us. So we have to admit that nature is capable of acting subjectively and can be understood not just as an object or a collection of objects, but also as a subject or a collection of subjects. And when I say subject, you can kind of interpret that as like something with a mind, something with its own motivation and free will. Um, And since we're part of nature, then nature has a mind because we have a mind. Our societal understanding of nature today is heavily rooted in science, and science is famously not really capable of dealing with questions of the subjective. 
But this isn't how it always was. Societies that existed prior to the invention of writing are what Bookchin calls organic societies, and they had a very different view of nature than we do today. His assertions about organic society are based on a combination of historical accounts of interactions with preliterate societies that used to exist, and of contemporary accounts of preliterate societies that exist today. When you say the basic, yeah. When you say organic, do you mean unmanipulated and untrifled with? Because that, that's what I think, just based on like context clues. Yeah. So it's not. It sounds like kind of a loaded phrase, but what you're mainly we're mainly talking about um, societies in which. Um, they are preliterate, so they don't really use um, writing, and not necessarily hunter-gatherers. We talk a little bit about how um, the kind of like organic society uh, way of doing things extends into like um, some like primitive horticulturalists and stuff like that, and how aspects of organic society actually exist um, even still today. Um, so. We're going to talk about what organic society means when we describe um, what the qualities of it tend to be in just a second, and we're going to maybe get a little bit of a better uh, understanding of what that means. All right, let's go for it. So the basic thread that unites these societies is a view of nature that is more holistic and interconnected than our more modern view, which sees nature through the lens of superiority and inferiority. The human relationship to nature was one of interdependency rather than one-sided exploitation. And because humans are a part of nature themselves, this interdependency extends to relationships between humans. We lack the language to describe and therefore understand the implications of this worldview. Words like equality or mutual aid are still wrapped up in bourgeois concepts of property and justice. The word Bookchin sticks with throughout most of this book is usufruct, which is a legal term that describes the right of one person to use the property of another. In this case, it more accurately refers to the universal right for all people to use that which they have need of. Societies based on this foundation exhibit certain features which Bookchin discusses here. Quote, These features can be summarized as complete parity or equality between individuals, age groups, and sexes, usufruct and later reciprocity, the avoidance of coercion in dealing with internal affairs, and finally, the irreducible minimum the inalienable right of every individual in the community to food, shelter, and clothing, irrespective of the amount of work contributed by the individual to the acquisition of the means of life. So Unquote. in that case, is it leaderless? Is it completely disorganized? Well, let's remember that leader and... Um, that a leader and, and like a, a hegemon or a coercive structure are not necessarily the same thing. Leadership can be uh, informed by um, like someone just being more experienced and people generally turning to them for leadership. And there's nothing wrong with that morally. Um, no, organic societies are not totally without um, organization whatsoever, um, but it's more like... Is it to some extent anarchist? Certainly. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's like, it's like, you know how, like when we play Apex and, and, and <laughs> it only took no, 12 really, episodes really, for us to get to the first Apex I know, but reference. really, um, um, yeah, I really play Warzone more these days, but, but let's take Apex, like how there's just three of us when we want to make a decision. Three of us in a party. Yeah. When we want to make a decision, we don't like vote on it. And also like neither, none of us like have absolute power over the other one. We just make decisions together and it, it kind of it's like more collective and it kind of transcends democracy in that way you know what i mean mm -hmm. when you when you mark somebody another player in the game it's not it's not so mm -hmm. you can be better at the game or advance so the whole team can yeah better. and because like our and because like our personal relationships are so wrapped are, because like the game is like wrapped up in our personal relationships because we're all friends playing together like the idea of not giving your friend ammo when he asks for it or like some like whatever item he needs like is like unthinkable it's like ridiculous you your friend has the right to the things that he needs to play the game and enjoy it in the same way that someone in an organic society just because they're a person has a right to the things that they need to survive and it's like the idea that 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 you would make this a transactional relationship is unthinkable and immoral yeah that would be pretty shitty i wouldn't play with you if it was like that i know right wouldn't that be horrible <laughs> You are the only person that I play with, so I probably would still do it anyway, but I digress. That's because I carry you. I, 
Okay, moving on. So, let's talk about how organic societies turned into a hierarchical and domineering civilization like we live in today. But we just went over a whole lot really fast, so I just want to tie that all together nice and neat first. These organic societies demonstrate the capability of humans to be motivated by forces other than personal interest, and they further demonstrate this capability is harnessed by a view of nature that is non-hierarchical, but particularly one that recognizes the subjective quality of natural phenomena. This is fundamentally different from the Marxist view we've discussed previously. According to Marx, people's politics arise from their material conditions. Likewise, material conditions are what we need to change if we're to create a better society. For Bookchin, an ecological society, as he describes it, requires a change in human culture and mindset specifically. Let's demonstrate the difference. From the perspective of historical materialism, as we discussed in our episode on Marx, changes in the material conditions of the people in a society are the cause for changes in the social structure. From Bookchin's perspective, shifts in the social structure are caused by social forces and often happen independently of changes in material conditions. The reason he believes this is because, on the one hand, plenty of preliterate societies had developed hierarchical structures long before they possessed the material wealth that a historical materialist would claim is necessary. On the other hand, organic societies often did possess a surplus of wealth, but cultural pressures often forced the wealthiest members to blow it in conspicuous shows of generosity, while actual social power was largely non-material in nature. So if hierarchy can develop without material surplus, and often doesn't come into being even when the surplus exists, we have to look somewhere else to find the source. The answer Bookchin arrives at is that hierarchy comes from biologically determined divisions of labor. The primary axes that divided groups of humans in organic society were age and sex. The elderly were less able to engage in useful labor, and though generally they would still be supported materially by the younger clan members in accordance with usufruct, this was still a vulnerable position to be in. Um, Bookchin talks about how oftentimes they would be the first person to be abandoned when the actual material capability of the society was not enough to support everyone, and how... What's going on? Sorry, do you hear the sirens in the background? I don't hear anything, man. Oh, Perfect. Sorry. It, it was it was very brief. I just wanted to make sure we weren't. So we were talking about how um, about how it sucks um, to be old. The elderly, the elderly have like a different position in, in an organic society because of biological factors um, and how this is kind of a vulnerable position. But they're also respected for their experience, which are all facts. As far as sex is concerned, organic society exhibited a degree of division of labor between men and women. The most important aspect of this division was the reservation of the social and later civil sphere for men and the domestic sphere for women. Now, it's not that men and women are biologically incapable of filling each other's roles. Women are perfectly able to hunt and to socialize with other clans and men are perfectly capable of handling the domestic sphere. There are some hard biological factors, bodies that are sexed male are not capable of rearing children, but these divisions are largely enforced socially. Even still, the existence of these divisions does not automatically imply a hierarchy. The organic society's view of nature is one in which distinct actors and forces form a cohesive and motivated whole. The story of human hierarchy begins with the figure of the elder clan shaman, who is generally both old and male, and I didn't put this part of my script I think it was just a miss scan in like the PDF version of the book that I was reading, but I, I, I said elder clan shaman there. My book actually said elder cum shaman, but he didn't mention cum ever again in the book. So I'm just going to assume that that was not meant to be there and that it was clan shaman. So I can just, I'm free to use that as a Twitter name, right? It won't be trademarked or copyrighted. I won't be stealing. Yeah, I was thinking. I was thinking that could be like an eventual like Patreon goal, like like the equivalent to uh what um to what um knowledge fight has for Raptor Princess could be Elder Cum Shaman. Elder Cum Shaman. If you're interested in being yeah. an Elder Cum Shaman, uh, please reach out via Twitter. I I, I welcome I welcome uh, other people into this clan. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't developed uh, what we're gonna what we're gonna worship or produce or how we're gonna function, but um. We will all become shamans. You you do get that title. I'll make jackets. Well, you might you might change your mind about that very shortly. Oh no! As you will see, 
the shaman is I've never met a just problematic the source of, cum shaman before. This will the be new. source of all evil. So as we said earlier, organic society is built on a view of nature that lends it a subjective, motivated character, basically viewing nature as something that's capable of having a mind of its own. This subjectivity is understood through a sort of mysticism that manifests in natural spirits, and the shaman is a figure who acts as a conduit for these spirits. This obviously lends the shaman some social power, but it also imposes a great vulnerability. If natural conditions go sour, the shaman is often the one who takes the blame. This is a problem for the shaman because these conditions are not actually under his control. So if you're the shaman, you want to protect yourself. To this end, you turn to the same group of people that political leaders have turned to ever since, the warriors. Organic societies did engage in warfare between clans. By allying himself with almost always male clan members who engaged in warfare, the shaman earned himself physical protection while the warriors got to vicariously wield some of his social power. Everybody wins except for everybody else. In this way, social power becomes political power, coercive power. The significant development here is that we're now seeing the emergence of divisions of labor and power structures that are wholly social in nature with no biological basis. The shaman does not represent the dominance of the elderly over the young, but rather that of a small group of men over the clan as a whole, including women and the young, but also men and other elderly. So the point is people just got to stop being less aggressive, or if people were less aggressive in um, prehistoric organic societies, then we would all be a lot happier. Yeah, there's actually like, a um it almost strikes me as like second wave feminist in a way and 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 i get where bookchin is coming from it but the way that he like talks about gender in general in this work um you 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 can feel the 80s seep through the book to a degree in what way um uh, it's just very gender essentialist in a lot of ways um i don't think that he's actually a gender essentialist like i don't think that he like thinks that like men are inherently this way or that women are inherently this way I think that he uses the terms male and female, masculine and feminine, matricentric, patricentric to refer to like gender as a socially enforced like thing and not as a biologically occurring thing. But the but he is he also just like kind of uses like this is the male way of thinking and the male way of doing things to to talk about like patriarchal society and like the feminine way of doing things, which kind of represents that like the motherly love and and usufruct and giving without the um desire to have something given in return is like kind of like the feminine way of doing things where the masculine way is more transactional and deals more in power directly mm. when was this written the i want to say 82 but okay. um so almost progressive for the for the era oh so, i mean obviously super duper progressive um for the 80s um i mean it's 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 honestly quite progressive today i mean um actually a fun fact is that murray bookchin um worked with with current green party candidate um maybe howie hawkins um back in the day and they actually knew each other that's pretty tight so that's pretty tight yeah um so a shamanistic hierarchy becomes a class society when the shaman can institute into the minds of the people an epistemology of rule, a fundamental worldview that justifies the domination of some people by others. What an epistemology of rule does, functionally, is shift the blame for whatever bad things happen from the shaman to the people. This relationship to blame is what differentiates the priest and the priestly corporation from the shaman. I feel like this is also represented in everyone who has... Like, like does does a shitty thing to make a lot of money and says, you know, they they kind of take the blame off themselves by saying, like, someone's going to do it. Why not me? You know, like, this is going to happen. Yeah. People, someone, someone's going to do this. Someone's going to take advantage of these people. And, you know, why, why, why not me? Why, why don't I take this little mm -hmm. shortcut or what have you? Yeah, that's definitely true. I, I, I also think of it in terms of, like, um, the way how, like, when people starve. We go, we don't go like, oh, like this is a failure of the government or of the nation. It's, 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 they just like sucked and they deserve to starve because they um, are just like shitty humans who like can't produce enough wealth on their own. That sounds like the, uh, if anyone's watched Innuendo Studios, um, the I Hate Mondays skit. 
when he talks about yeah, how certain exactly. people, like different political parties, view certain things as just like um, inevitabilities. Things are just going to happen. Can't do mm-hmm. anything about it. So, um, a fun quote from Book Chin. Quote, Technical failure, in effect, was shifted from the priestly corporation to a fallen humanity that had to atone for its moral frailties. And only priestly supplications, visibly reinforced by generous sacrifices in the forms of goods and services, could redeem humanity, temper the punitive actions of the deities, and restore the earlier harmony that existed between humanity and its gods. In time, sacrifice and supplication became a constant effort in which neither the community nor its priestly corporation could relent. When this effort was institutionalized to the extent that the episodic became chronic, it created the early theocracies that go hand in hand with early cities, whose foci were always the temple, its priestly quarters, its storehouses, craft shops, and the dwellings of its artisans and bureaucracies. Unquote. And let's remember, these corporations are male-dominated. As they become the center of political power, the society as a whole takes on a more patriarchal character. Class society is inextricable in its development from patriarchy. So where does the state come into this? Well, the priesthood is only able to enforce its epistemology of rule with the support of the warrior class or the military. The state arises when the military arm is able to enforce its own epistemology of rule directly. Something to keep in mind is that these early states of the Bronze Age and even the Classical Era were relatively non-invasive in comparison to our states today. The epistemology of rule supplanted the epistemology of usufruct in the cities, but the rural agricultural population was largely left alone besides the imposition of taxes and periodic corvée labor, which is basically forced, unpaid labor dictated by the state. But, you know, you, you would only have to do this sometime out of the year. These rural populations tended to resist the epistemology of rule as much as they could and continued to live according to the values of organic society, of usufruct, of the irreducible minimum, to the degree that they were allowed up until the advent of modern capitalism. And this continues to be the case in many parts of the world outside of the West, even in large states today. Bookchin is not like, he doesn't like hate Marx. He's generally a fan of Marx's analysis of the material effects of capitalism. But one of his major critiques of Marxism is this idea that the development of complex civilization requires the development of coercive and hierarchical systems. And it's only the point after industrial capitalism has created the amount of material wealth it has that the general population can be freed from domination. Bookchin basically says, look, people have been living by customs that are every bit as communist, if not more, than the ideals that Marxists proclaim, and yet the Marxist view of these societies has historically been one of condescension and pity. The oriental mode of production, as Marx called it, was a form of societal arrested development, and Bookchin considered this view to be a form of Victorian hubris. What we're seeing in the earliest political institutions is an epistemology of rule based on coercion. This is a fundamentally unsustainable way to run a society, primarily because people need to be on board with you at least to some degree in order for them to be okay with you politically dominating and exploiting them, but also because it's actually quite difficult to accumulate wealth and power when might really does equal right. A much more useful epistemology is justice, equal and exact. Justice is famously symbolized by a woman, blindfolded, holding a scale. What's communicated on the surface is that justice is the same for all people, that no personal bias will infect the process by which we decide what is right, what is owed. However, what's implied a bit deeper is that the value of all things can ultimately be translated into a single quantitative unit of account. You know, like dollars. Money. You could try to equate justice with usufruct to some degree. Both are ostensibly egalitarian positions. But between the two, only usufruct is capable of motivating a genuinely equal society. This is because usufruct doesn't engage in the quantifying of nature the way that justice does. To quantify nature is to objectify it, to deny its subjectivity. And when you apply this thinking to nature you necessarily apply it to humans as well. Organic societies are basically incapable of having a concept of justice because the kind of quantifying you would have to do is impossible from an epistemology that recognizes the subjective character of nature and humans alike. However, 
Justice, the idea that one should receive from society the same value that they've contributed, is much more useful to states and their privileged classes who want to maximize the contributions of their subjects. Yeah? Are you missing something? Just like... I'm, I'm not I'm not I'm not sure what just happened. I yeah. feel like I have a question about it, but like I'm having trouble like formulating it and understanding what was just like. Let's walk through it. Read and talked about. Um, so by this, do you mean that um, like a fair. Like in, Here, maybe- in organic societies, are you saying no crime can be committed because there's no property or still can i feel like that's that's oversimplifying so you're you're using a very i I feel like you're you're applying a very um like daily use version of the word justice where like it really refers to crime whereas i'm more talking about justice as the idea that everything uh the the idea that what we get from society should be exactly equal to what we contribute to it on a personal level that's what is just that someone gets out what they put in and that's fundamentally opposed to use of oh. which believes that people deserve at least an irreducible minimum from a society regardless of their contribution okay so so justice is use of but actually quantifying it and saying like you've put in x amount you yeah. get x in, amount in other words and... uh murray bookchin kind of uses this way of describing it is that usufruct is the equality of unequals whereas justice is the equality of equals but which necessarily implies the inequality of un- of unequals you know what i mean <laughs> no but yeah <laughs> i think so <laughs> yeah um no okay you, yeah, sure? no, I think I got it. We can we can keep going. Let's with just it. fucking no. Okay, let's just fucking fine. move on. It sounds like you're explaining like the concept of right and wrong to a four year old in a, in the nicest way possible. You're only insulting yourself, my friend. I know, and the real Alex would never take a chance, never pass up a chance to self deprecate. Organic societies also don't really have a concept of freedom. Freedom, as we understand it, is of course pervasive throughout these societies, but the absence of domination makes a word for freedom less necessary. Our earliest known use of the term freedom dates back to Mesopotamia, and it tellingly translates to return to the mother. Remember, we discussed how domination and patriarchy are inextricable. Freedom, on the other hand, is inextricable from the concept of usufruct, the unconditional love and support that one expects from the mother, made universal across a whole society. Freedom is the knowledge that whatever one's contributions or abilities, that the whole society recognizes one's right to that which they are in need of. When Bookchin talks about groups of people throughout written history struggling for freedom, this is what he's talking about. Quote, Historically, the earliest expressions of freedom within the realm of unfreedom consists of popular attempts to restore the irreducible minimum and the circulation of wealth frozen in the temples, manors, and palaces of the ruling class. The big men, initially the tribal warrior chieftains, later the nobles and monarchs of the secular realm and their priestly counterparts, were the custodians of society's use values. They collected them in storehouses and redistributed them according to a hierarchy of values that increasingly reinforced their authority. The early history of civilization is largely an account of the custodians' expanding grip of the productive process, their deployment and rationalization of labor, their control over its fruits, and their personal appropriation of an increasingly larger fraction of the labor process and its social product, unquote. Perhaps the most interesting ingredient to this mix was Christianity, which managed to play both sides of the struggle between freedom and domination for pretty much the whole period between the emergence of Christianity as a temporal power in the form of the papacy and the Enlightenment, which touted principles like equality, but ultimately enmeshed them in liberal concepts like justice rather than usufruct. Quoting Bookchin once again, quote, That a later generation of liberals represented by John Stuart Mill rebelled against the crude reduction of ethics to mere problems of functional utility did not rescue liberalism from a patent loss of normative concepts of justice and progress. Indeed, if interests alone determine social and ethical norms, 
What could prevent any ideal of justice, individuality, and social progress from gaining public acceptance? The inability of liberal theory to answer this question in any terms other than practical utility left it morally bankrupt. Henceforth, it was to preach a strictly opportunistic message of expediency rather than ethics, of meliorism rather than emancipation, of adaptation rather than change. And I think I'm going to edit in kind of like a... Like a bullhorn, like, ooh, owned the liberals, because we love to do that on our show. <laughs> yeah, no, but what you said earlier in the other paragraph, also, I really liked, because um, I feel like Christianity is... Um, you're, at least Catholicism in general, it's um, it's uh, obviously mm-hmm. a lot of guilt, and it's a lot of um, like if if you are if you are like um, like disenfranchised or having bad things happen to you, it's more because like you're not you're not praying enough or you're mm-hmm. not um, like being a good Christian and you have to you know confess and everything like that. It's um. It's like a quantifying the, the thing, good things you've done. Like if you do all these good things, then generally you will have a good and fulfilling life. So it's like putting putting the burden on you, not you are entitled to a certain amount of goodness in your life, which would be. But it's, um, it, it, it kind of works in both directions, right? Because Christianity, like as you were just saying, is this is this. It basically provides a way to create incentives that have no like material basis. So like when, if you're like the Pope then you're getting people to accept your domination regardless of, you know, you know, just because you say so because of this kind of spiritual aspect of the whole thing. But at the same time, Christianity represents a system of morality in which, at least when taken at its word, people are generally expected to give freely without expecting anything in return. And, 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 and that's kind of something that like liberalism is basically lacking in is this idea that um, it's ever okay to expect a group or a society to to give in any way that isn't transactional, and so and so you can see how it kind mm-hmm. of plays both sides. And and historically, um, we you know this is something that that literally happened that that that, that Christianity would play both sides. Like um, Bookchin talks, like I believe, like I believe everyone should be. Um, have a certain amount of happiness, but I'm not willing to personally expend from my personal store to mm-hmm. make sure that happens, right? I generally believe that everyone should be giving to each other, but if someone has less than me, it's not my job to take care of it, which was why I guess justice isn't working in the situation and use of yeah. is better. And, and, and that quote that I just read a second ago really defines our age in a sense, right? Bookchin uses a term called scientism, which... Uh, that I think is a really interesting term. And so like science is a process by which we arrive at a certain kind of truth. Scientism is the ideological position that science is the only way to arrive at truth. And um, he also has a kind of a similar term for rationalism um, being like the ideological um, position that like rationality and like pure logic is like where truth comes from and that there's no room for the, what, what you're seeing as a parallel between these all these things that there's no room for subjectivity like we've been talking about earlier that everything has to be quantifiable measurable and can be like done transactionally yeah you have to be able to own people with facts and logic yeah and uh notably absent in this worldview is any space to consider the subjective with any seriousness the upshot of this way of thinking is that it basically makes it impossible to challenge the moral framework of capitalism and that's why the mainstream political questions of our day, at least as Americans, are not about whether our, our continued exploitation of natural resources is moral, but how to do it most efficiently. It's not about whether a raw increase in material wealth is desirable, it's about which method will get it done better. This is kind of the way that people talk about markets. Markets are an economic tool that produces a predictable outcome, but we can't make decisions about where to employ them based on their results because the dominant ideology is one that depends on markets to tell it what's right and wrong. We must begin to recognize the subjectivity of the natural world, not just because the statement that the natural world acts with a more sophisticated motivation than pure physics is a fact, but also because the subjectivity is the only source we have for a moral counterbalance to our present state. 
in which all things are liquid and interchangeable, and the only moral good is the unrestrained accumulation of whatever abstract unit of account we use to measure it. Side yeah. note, the first half of that paragraph, I thought you were just riffing, and I was like, this guy's good. And I was I was so into it and not reading well, it all and just like letting you run. I was like, then I realized shit. Well, you're gonna be you're gonna be um pleased to learn that even when I'm not just riffing and I'm reading scripted things. I also wrote the scripted things. So this guy is good is equally applicable. Mm. Hot. So I know what you're thinking, Alex. What? What does Bookchin want from us? Fuck, how'd you know? I get the feeling that he's probably starting to sound a bit like an Anprim. Like an, <laughs> uh, he certainly was to me at this point. He is and- a bit of a Unabomber type. Yeah, anarcho-primitivism is a bit of a tough sell, but luckily, no. Bookchin does not want us to go back in time to our pre-industrial way of life. In a purely philosophical sense, Bookchin wants us to do two major things. The first is that he wants us to reframe the meaning of science, rationality, and the techniques of civilization that they've given to us. We have to see them as things we can do to achieve certain ends, but not as comprehensive theories about all of existence. Second, you probably guessed, we have to recognize nature as an active subject with a right to exist on its own terms. As long as nature remains a collection of objects to be exploited, environmentalism can only ever involve pleas to accumulate more responsibly to protect future prospects of accumulation. An ecological society is one in which we treat nature as a friend or a family member rather than a traitor. I wouldn't say sounding like an Anprim, more like an eco-socialist currently. Well, he is an eco-socialist. Oh, I hit him now right on the fucking head. Amazing. And 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 that's how I'm pretty sure that's how Howie Hawkins um 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 identifies as well. So that makes sense. Let's dive into what Bookchin believes his ecological society will look like. The first thing you'll notice as a listener of our show is a conspicuous similarity to Kropotkin and that the commune is the basic unit of society. We live today in a society where the individual is the basic unit. We know from our discussion on Foucault and from Bookchin himself that individualism does not make us free, but instead makes us vulnerable to more invasive forms of domination and more precise means of control. Within the commune, the individual exists and exhibits personal autonomy, but that autonomy is protected by a community based on the organic customs of usufruct and the irreducible minimum. Where organic societies were built on blood relations, these communes could be built on a voluntary association. On a larger scale, Bookchin imagines communes composed of smaller communes. A defining characteristic across all of these communes would be direct democracy, which Bookchin believed to be the only true form of democracy. Direct democracy, according to Bookchin, institutionalizes direct action turning a temporary and spontaneous action into a repeated responsibility, a sort of permanent revolution, if you will. And to finish up, I'm just going to read a fairly long bit from the final chapter of the book. And this book was like really emotional for me to read on the whole. We kind of went over a lot, and I'm willing to bet that people who are listening to this are like just going like, what the f- fuck are they talking about with this entire thing i have no idea he (laughs) bookchin talks about how how this book is like it's just going to be like free flowing like it's just a collection of ideas and i want people to draw their own conclusions from it and that's what i'm trying to do in this episode here um but how said that in the foreword yeah i'm hope yeah um but this last bit um i like i i like it when when theory isn't just sad um and 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 there's actually some kind of vision for the future that it that 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 feels genuinely positive and so quote communes networked confederally through ecosystems bioregions and biomes must be artistically tailored to their natural surroundings we can envision that their squares will be interlaced by streams their places of assembly surrounded by groves their physical contours respected and tastefully landscaped their soils nurtured caringly to foster plant variety for ourselves, our domestic animals, and wherever possible the wildlife that may support on their fringes. 
We can hope that the communes would aspire to live with, nourish, and feed upon the life forms that indigenously belong to the ecosystems in which they are integrated. Decentralized and scaled to human dimensions, such eco-communities would obey nature's law of return by recycling their organic waste into composited nutriment for gardens and such materials as they can rescue for their crafts and industries. We can expect that they would subtly integrate solar, wind, hydraulic, and methane-producing installations into a highly variegated pattern for producing power. Agriculture, aquaculture, stock raising, and hunting would be regarded as crafts, an orientation that we hope would be extended as much as possible to the fabrication of use values of nearly all kinds. The need to mass-produce goods in highly mechanized installations would be vastly diminished by the community's overwhelming emphasis on quality and permanence. Vehicles, clothing, furnishings, and utensils would often become heirlooms to be handed down from generation to generation, rather than discardable items that are quickly sacrificed to the gods of obsolescence. The past would always live in the present, as the treasured arts and works of generations gone by." Unquote. That just sounded like the most beautiful, wistful, uh, eco-mutualist daydream. Now you're just making up terms. What? No, I, I, I don't know. I'm just putting prefixes together that make sense. But seriously, I, I wish, I wish we had more of this. I would, I would follow any sort of you know social media account that just talked about like you know, wouldn't it be nice if this, like that was that was beautifully written, and I feel like. One, um, there's like too much, even in, in the theory is too much. It, it's very like nihilist and depressing when you compare mm-hmm. it to the reality we have today. And that, that, was, that was just some nice musing. And two, I think this man would have loved HGTV, you know, some house hunters. I don't know some that ti- he would have. tiny house. <laughs> no, no, no. Like tiny, like the, you know, like the tiny houses they have, like the 600 square foot houses that are like, um like minimal environmental impact and uh, make great use of space. That's true. I st- I think that the problem with that is that it's still, it doesn't get at what he really, really wants, which is like that fundamental worldview change, right? Because like the way that we talk about like being carbon neutral or like climate change in general, like in the, in the, in the general sphere is that it's always about, it's always about how, climate change is actually a really bad investment in the long term and how like and how like it's going to be worse for our quality of life in the long run and like worse for you know gdp in the long run um and stuff like that uh which is all like factually true and all but it kind of misses the deeper point that nature is a thing that exists that 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 deserves to exist on its own terms and that the fact that 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 ecological disaster and climate change will eventually hurt us is like the last reason. Like that's the least most important reason. The fact that you are hurting nature is wrong on its own. Yeah. Even if it doesn't lead to total collapse of economies and civilizations. Yeah. And, and ultimately like until we can come down and, and, and I think a lot of people believe that don't get me wrong. I think a lot of people believe that, but it's not, it's not how we run our societies it's not the belief that we run our societies based on and until that changes environmentalism is only ever going to be a matter of like investment and 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 investing in further growth down the line rather than what it should be which is actually putting that preservation of 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 nature above above the need to grow which is what we're actually going to need to do if we're ever going to really bring this to a halt yeah, that sounds. And it's the and it's the same thing. It's the same thing with how we treat each other, right? Like, we can talk all day about how more collectivist government policies will make the GDP grow higher and and make people's quality of life be better. But at the end of the day, like, what we really need is for people to generally come to understand and agree that the lives of the people that exist in a society are just worth more than growing that wealth as much as you possibly can. Because right now, the way that we think about it is that the quality of life is only good to the degree that it serves that wealth accumulation. And we need to learn to put that on a higher degree. And it's that 
it's that it's that scientism that 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 need for everything to always be quantified that makes it basically impossible um amongst people who generally accept capitalism to critique it on any kind of moral basis as we talked about earlier and it's very frustrating yeah i feel like marianne williamson would have gotten a great kick out of this i was i was yeah i was talking to to i'm sure she's read it honestly yeah she's she seems like i mean she's like what is she, she's probably friends with howie um, that would not surprise me yeah i i was talking to my girlfriend about um marianne williamson recently and you know we we we, we enjoyed like her as like orb queen and like the meme and whatever um during like the primary which is still going on but it's over but whatever um and um and she was like you know obviously like i understand that like marianne williamson was never really a serious candidate and she you know we we've both heard that she's an anti-vaxxer but we haven't actually looked into how or why so um i certainly believe it (laughs) based on uh how she acts but not important but the point is that um what she really appreciated about her was how unabashedly empathetic her um, campaign was and how it didn't f- how she didn't feel the need to justify taking a moral stance by it's going to raise the GDP or it's going to make unemployment go down, which is kind of the space that we're locked in rhetorically in American politics and in, in most worldwide politics at this point is that moral things can't just be good they have to be profitable and it's really sad yeah she had an interview on uh another podcast i listened to like a a, a while it wasn't the rubin report was it no god knows something called um escobar drug home um (laughs) anyway no it it was just it was just (laughs) nice to finally hear someone talk about something that i already shill our podcast on chapo trap house you can just say okay i i listened to her interview with i think it was virgil maybe some other people on chapo but it was just so nice to hear someone talk about just i don't know um it was nice to hear someone talk about all the things you just mentioned without having to get into the minute details of why it's important. Mm-hmm. Just understand, like, coming from a point of understanding, like, of course, this is what we should do. Of course. And wouldn't it be nice mm-hmm. if we did that? Mm-hmm. Oh, there's actually there's actually one more thing that I wanted to talk about. I know that you you like astrology more than I do. Dude, I don't know why, uh, but, where everyone gets this idea from. I thought it was fun. I downloaded CoStar like no, one time. No, it's fine. No, I'm not criticizing. I'm not criticizing. It's my okay. God, my coworkers make fun of me all the time. I mentioned Shh. it one time. It's okay. Bro. It's all right. So I know you love astrology. <laughs> um, but, 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 um, but like that, that, that. We, we, we kind of like joke about uh, people trying to kind of inject um mysticism into daily life and while like i don't necessarily agree that the mysticism is true there is like a fundament there is like something really beneficial to i think having some space for that mysticism because i think that mysticism is a way in which we can kind of bring subjectivity into the material world um in a way that i think that a lot of people aren't comfortable doing uh in a secular way can you expand on mysticism? So anything that like feels supernatural, you know, um, just the the idea of believing that there is something greater than just physics in the world that has like a mind of its own with motivations and, and that, that imbues the world with meaning that 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 can at least give us the room to say that something is morally right. Um, that isn't just based on pure personal interest. Yeah. Um, mysticism kind of gives us that that room to do that and and so that's why i've made a pledge that i'm going to stop hating on astrology and like mysticism that people get into so much because as much as i don't think that it's like real i i i uh, coming to understand the way in which like capitalism requires on stamping out mysticism as much as possible so that people are purely thinking about things in numerical like quantitative quantifiable terms um gives me an appreciation for um the at least use of mysticism to society yeah no that's 100 percent true like for for um for how much i don't align myself with any religion at all and i i don't know i just just don't generally don't agree with it 
it's mm-hmm. I, I like any religious person I've known is just always so like at peace. If they like don't understand why something's happening, they're just like, yep, it's it's because of God. It's and it's okay. And they're like just so at peace and okay. And I wish I could do that. It, it, I don't know it, if I would ever say that. I don't know if I'd say that every religious person I've met is so at peace. No. Okay. Okay. That was a gross overgeneralization. No, 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 but I'm just kidding. In, in like personal matters, like um, if, if, if um, used correctly, it's just like, you know, some things are out of my hands. Like they do the serenity prayer on it and they're just like, yeah. you know, things are just going to be like, and there's mm-hmm. some things I can't control. And it's like, wow, it's, it's so nice. That got really tangential. I don't really think that it did, honestly. Um, this this idea that we need to imbue the natural world with subjectivity and understand it as something that motivates itself, that isn't just moved by physics, is is super duper... Like, that's the thesis of the book. So I, I don't think that that was tangential at all. Yeah. Anyway, that's that's all that's all I have. What about you, Mark? Yeah, that's, that's... I'm trying out a new ending line. That's all the theory I have for today. Wow, straight to the point. Beautiful. So if you want to keep up with us in future episodes, if you like this episode, want to hear more, you want to request new episodes, you can follow us at the aforementioned uh, Twitter account at We Read Theory Pod. I am up at all hours of the night just refreshing the page, like just like waiting for that next uh, theory recommendation. We are it's also, like heroin. I, I, I know. I know. It's the most beautiful yeah. opioidist theory. I, I do. I do want to say that like we, we have gotten recommendations from people already. We we have seen them. We've talked about them. We we have episodes kind of in the pipeline that we're planning on doing. Um, I have like at least the next four or five episodes planned out. Some of the recommendations are in there. Some of them are going to have to wait for a while. We might not get to all of them because there's a lot of really interesting theory that we want to get to. Um, but, but yeah, keep sending those in. We'll. Yeah. We'll uh, look through it on the fly. Yeah, and we're always it's... interested in hearing what kinds of, yeah, if you, even if you don't have like a name in mind, like if there are issues that you want to hear us talk about, that's also a perfectly valid um, recommendation. True. And it doesn't have to be this um, mainstream stuff you hear about mm-hmm. and it's going to help you out in day to day. If it's obscure, but it's interesting, we mm-hmm. want to hear about it. We're kind of getting, yeah, we're kind of at the point right now where we want to get through all the mainstream stuff so that we can start getting into the more obscure stuff. Beautiful. Even though Bookchin isn't, well, well, I'll play my cards a little bit closer to the chest for now. Subjective. Okay. But you'll know the plan soon. Ooh. Anyway, you can uh, listen to this episode on YouTube if that's your preferred method of listening. For some reason. Or uh, wherever you get your podcast. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, uh, Spotify, uh, Overcast, Podcast Addict um really wherever or anchor <laughs> anchor.fm slash we read theory if you want and to hey, go straight to the source and hey since we're stretching out this plug to be about seven thousand years long um if you really like the show consider leaving us a positive uh review on apple podcasts that'd be really really great helps us with all that algorithm type stuff um <clears throat> and i can show my mom and she's very proud of me so <laughs> There's your there's your quantitative and your qualitative reason. Yeah, seriously, we've had a couple of reviews already, which we didn't even tell you guys to do. Love that, love yeah, they that. Made me come. Yeah, that's Jesus fucking. I'm trying to be wholesome for like five seconds here. Um, yeah, yeah. Shout out to the two people who gave um, some lengthy reviews. That was awesome. And we did listen. We did listen. One guy asked uh, if we could get a better mic, and we did. Okay, we Alex. did. What? Alex. We have to end this. We're almost at an hour. Okay, fine. I'm killing it. I'm killing it. We're done. Okay. okay. I love you. uh, Yeah. Love, love all of you. Have a good night.